fear. Often our lives can be overcome by it. We can find ourselves gripped by the fears of the world at war, disease, crumbling finances, death, and just simply missing out. Fear can cripple us and rob us of the joy in our lives. But what if there was a cure for fear? One of the most repeated commands in scripture is do not be afraid. What if we can truly find freedom from fear when we know, trust, and obey God? What if God, his work, and his promises are all we need to have a peace that surpasses understanding? Do you want to live free from fear? And the answer, of course, is... You know, it is such a, it really is a holy thing to think that the enthronement of Christ in our souls would be evidenced by a freeing of us from a fearfulness of the world in which we're living. And that's what we're praying happens during these days. Welcome. Good morning, friends. Uh, Lakeland family, it certainly is fun being together. Um, if you're newer to Lakeland and I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Dan. Um, I'm going to turn off my... Oh, my, somebody just texted me here. Let me just shut this off real quick. Um, if we haven't had a chance to meet, um, on behalf of our whole church family, I am so... Now some of you are like texting me. Don't do that, please. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, I, I, I hope you'll introduce yourself to me. I'd love to meet you today and get to know you. Where, whether God's leading you to Lakeland or another church, we just want you to be plugged into his people and be growing in him. And so I'm, I'm glad you're here. If you're newer, you may not know that we are nine weeks into a series we're talking about, about overcoming different areas of fear in our lives. And today, today the one we talk about is fear of not knowing the future, all of the stuff that comes up in us when we don't know the future. So I need a volunteer because I have a magic trick I'm going to do. Can I just have a volunteer, someone I've not talked to? If you don't raise a hand, I'm going to call on you, Jim Marsh. So somebody ought to... Jim Marsh, hey, would you come and join me? Uh, give Jim a round of applause. <laughs> you are about to go out on the World Wide Web, buddy. Come on up. <laughs> now, we did not talk about this ahead of time. Nope. <laughs> I'm not going to live this down here for a little bit. So no. I, we are talking about fear of the future. I'm going to do a trick in which I predict the future, okay? So I have a prediction here about something that you are about to do, and I want you to hold on to that, okay? While you hold that, I have a deck of cards. It's a card trick, okay? Hope I haven't done this one for you. Regular deck of cards. I want you to think of any card, and I'll name it for you. Don't tell me where it is. Think of a card. Got it. It's written there. Go ahead and open that up and see my prediction. Sealed. Really? It's on a piece of paper. Go ahead and show everybody what it is. Do you want to show that to everybody? Your card is Phil. Well, I said I'd name his card. Now, now no, 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 stay put. What I didn't show you was that on the back of this deck is a different name. Their names all the way through. Alan, Mike, Paul, Sam, Jake, Jim, Lisa, Des. Yeah. What's your card? Five of spades. Five of spades. Let's see if we can find it here. Five of spades. Five of spades. You want to take that out and look at the back? <laughs> can everybody give Jim a round of applause? Thank you. That's a gift to you. You can have that forever. <laughs> This is the only way I can, get st I can keep my magic hobby alive. So thanks for en enduring that with me for a little bit. What I love about that trick, of course it's a trick, but wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if indeed you could predict the future? I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could know that, if you could go to someone and know the future? I think, um, I think it is a common malady of human existence, one thing God doesn't experience at all, that we don't know the future and because we don't know the future, all kinds of things rise up inside of us. I, I was, I'm not surprised, but one New York Times article that I ran across this last week noted that tarot card reading is an industry that online Zoom meetings has skyrocketed during COVID. And uh, the commentator, who was actually a psychologist, noted that probably one of the barometers of American cultural health has to do with how much people are talking to fortune tellers. Same thing actually happened after 9-11. There was this spike because there is this yearning that grips the hearts of us to want to know the future. 
If you feel anxiety about the future, if that's something that happens to you regularly, do us all a favor. Raise your hand. Go ahead and raise it really high just so we can see, okay? This is something we feel, and it's something that obvious, it makes obvious sense why we feel it. But here's the question I'm going to ask. As followers of Jesus, is this one of the places where the presence of Christ changes us? Not that we know the, I mean, we know the ultimate future. We know ultimately where God is leading history, but between now and there, there's a hope, there's a big question mark every single day. Does our response to that question mark, is it different when I remember that Jesus is with me? When I stop and he's my first thought, who I know is working and I'm asking him to work and waiting and watching for his work. I'm going to just tell you, it isn't that you know the future that you didn't know. It isn't that it doesn't matter as much as it did to you before, but it is a completely different thing when you approach an unknown future with a known God. So in this series called Overcoming Fear, if you remember on Easter morning, I asked us to write out fears that, we, that, that really are significant. One, two, three of them. We actually posted them on the left side. And you can see movement, migration as people not have come to perfection. Overcoming fear is maybe overstated because none of us are going to fully overcome fear. But we've been looking for progress, that we would fear, feel fear less often. When we feel it, it would be less intense. And it would go away more quickly because we're learning the discipline when we feel fear of lifting our attention to God. And so if you haven't done it yet, if you've been feeling not total freedom, but if there's been progress in your heart, at the end of the service, I want to encourage you to go over and grab one of those and grab your card and move it over if you can't find it, because we have so many fears on the left side. Some of them said, I can't find my card. Just write a new one. That's totally fine. But that's a testimony of something God is doing actually in our hearts. And today we want to talk about this one about overcoming fear of the future. And I think the point we see is this. Christians don't have to fear. In fact, Christians don't fear an unknown future when we're actively trusting a known God. When I trust the God who is in my future, that changes this entirely. And so if you live with a lot of anxiety about the future, well, first of all, come to know Jesus. That'll change everything. But second of all, let him be your first thought. And this is, you'll be helped by what it is that we see today in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. So if you would open your Bibles, uh, it's page 530 on the Bible underneath your page, under, under, your, uh, under your chair. We're going to look at the enti- skip through the entire chapter, all 26 verses, so you will be helped if you have it open. This, this text will, like snow coming off a hot roof, will free your heart and your soul from fear that grips you as you open up there. Man, what a great thing. Now, let me note... I don't normally do this. Acts 1, 1 to 26 actually has a primary message I am not going to preach today, which is really unusual for me to do. But the reason we're in this text is that there is a thread that finds its way through that text that I am going to speak because this illustrates something so profoundly. So so it's unusual that I would do this. What I'm saying is biblical, but it's not the primary point of this text, but it is a point of this text. And because it's familiar ground, I think it's even more helpful for us. So I will acknowledge, hopefully I'll have Bereans coming up to me after they, I would have otherwise saying, you know, that's not the main point of that passage, which I would welcome, that you pay attention and hear with the scriptures as the filter through which you hear. But what I think we hear today is very, very, very helpful. And it is what we see happening in the hearts of Jesus' followers when they face an unbelievably unexpected thing. Now, these disciples have been with Jesus for three years. Would you agree with me that likely a fair amount of their time they spent facing Jesus doing unexpected things? Would you agree with me that there was a lot of unexpected? If you're a follower of Jesus, especially one of his disciples, you would have regularly said something like, wow, I didn't see that coming. And that definitely happens here. So our first point to unpack this, I'm free of fear um, of the future when I know and the God in the future. Uh, The first thing is this, not knowing the future is normal Christ following. It is normal to not know what the future is. If you're thinking, I don't have any idea what the future is, and don't think something strange is happening to you. This is kind of the way it always is. So again, we see this with Jesus. How many times did Jesus do things the disciples didn't expect? 5,000 people, the disciples said, send them away so they can eat. Jesus said, no, no, give me a couple fish and some bread and I'll feed everyone. Didn't see that one coming. 
It didn't occur to them to go to Jesus even the second time and say, why don't you multiply the bros, the, the bros? Why don't you multiply the bros? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's one way of talking about evangelism, the bread and the loaves, so that, gosh, my mind is just going faster than my lips. That's really not a good thing. It was very unexpected when this huge crowd was following Jesus on the way to Jerusalem at one point, and he turned around and looked them in the eye and said, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you'll have no part of me. And most of the crowd left. Didn't see that one coming, for sure. Absolutely, they didn't see, even when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, or before that, in the upper room, as he, as he, as he met their needs and washed their feet, they probably didn't see the sovereign ruler of the universe who had all things placed under his feet, donned the garment of a servant and washed their feet. Didn't see that one coming. That the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. They didn't see as he rode into Jerusalem to the throng of at least 100,000 people screaming, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They didn't see that turning into not defeating the Romans, but in fact, letting the Romans kill him. They didn't see that coming. And they didn't see his death being the means by which our true and deepest enemy, which is sin and judgment and the grave, were defeated when he rose again. To follow Jesus is to, is to spend a whole lot of time saying, didn't see that one coming. And now we come to Acts chapter 1, and this is absolutely true here. So verse 8 we read, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He's, he's about to leave. He gives this commission, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He'd already said, stay until the Holy Spirit is poured out upon you. So they, they, they received a little bit of direction, but then they came to verse 9. <laughs> and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Okay, who thinks they said, okay, we didn't see that one coming? <laughs> By the way, the cloud isn't a cumulonimbus. When Jesus said he's coming in the clouds, the point is not, well, sunny day, Jesus isn't coming today, because it's the Shekinah glory, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God came and took Jesus, and he's there, and suddenly, physically, bodily, <laughs> and what do they do? As a result of that, verse 10, they're gazing into heaven. What do you do after Jesus? Who, by the way, you followed for three years, and now you're in Jerusalem because he, you followed him down there, and he died, and he rose again. I guess you're probably used to thinking, I, I don't ever try to predict what Jesus is about to do. He ascends to heaven. And so they're standing, gazing at the heavens. And just so they don't stay out all day and for the next day, the Lord sends two angels. Behold, two men stood by in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why are you standing and looking into heaven? And I might respectfully say that's sort of obvious, don't you think? Jesus just ascended. But then he went on, these men went on to say, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, wow, what a thing to have witnessed will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And all I can think is the disciples saying, well, we didn't see that happening. We didn't see that coming. The truth is, the disciples spent most of their time not knowing what God was about to do. They didn't know they were going to spend 40, we know what happened, we know the story, but it's 40 days before what Jesus just said is fulfilled, this promise is given. And the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. And this miracle of the church takes place where people from every tribe and nation, when you actually map in Acts chapter 2 where the people that were in Jerusalem came from, you literally notice that they perfectly circle Jerusalem except due east, which is out in the Mediterranean Sea. People from all around Jerusalem are in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. And they're, so they're coming from other nations, Ethiopians and Syrians and on and on. And as they gather, when they hear the disciples, so something powerful happening, they hear the disciples speak in their own languages, declaring the wonders of God. Right? Babel is reversed, and this confusing language becomes worship-evoking language, and the church is born, and 3,000 people are baptized. I dare say that morning they didn't expect that to happen. To be a follower of Jesus means you don't know what's coming. 
And knowing that, I think, is an incredibly helpful thing. But it's always been that way. Do you remember when God began his work in this era? He began it with Abram. Abraham, in chapter 12, verse 1 of Genesis, we read, Now the Lord said to Abraham, go, or Abram, go, to your, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land. Let's say this out loud. To the land that I will show you. We've all laughed about that, right? Where are you going? I don't know. He hasn't showed me yet. But he, the, he started out in faith and Abraham obeyed. It is normal for this. It was normal for Abraham's grand, great-grandson, Joseph, to live this way. He didn't, he didn't know what was coming when he was betrayed by his brothers. He didn't know what was coming when he was sold as a slave. He didn't into Egypt. He didn't know what was coming when Potiphar, the, the, the official in Egypt, brought him into his home and things went well. He didn't know what was going to happen when he was falsely accused of being improper with Potiphar's wife and be thrown back in jail. He didn't know what was going to happen when he spent years in jail until at just the right time, at just the right circumstance, with his heart having been frankly, disciplined a bit by the Lord to learn humility that he would, in the space of a day, go from being imprisoned and forgotten to being the second most powerful man in the world. He could not have seen that. So that he was in a place, so that his family could become a nation in a land that would never intermarry with them, so that Israel would remain Israel. See, here's one of the great things we see again and again and again. When we don't know the future, not only does God know the future, but he's birthing a better future. That's the thing we see take place over and over again. It happened with Moses. When Moses led Israel out of Egypt after this great victory of the 10 plagues and the Egyptians saying, go, go, and pressing all of their possessions into the hands of Israel. As they go out, God leads them this way and this way and this way. And then, and then Pharaoh thinks, what was I thinking? Letting these people go. And he mounts up his chariots and goes out to either re-enslave or kill all of Israel. And Israel's back is against the Red Sea. And you, they think they're going to die. We spent eight weeks just in Exodus 14 and 15 one time, just unpacking that scene. But what they didn't know is what God was going to do. Chapter 14, verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were driven. Verse 22, and the people of Israel went down into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. And then, of course, you know, the Egyptians followed them into the sea and God commanded Moses to pray the sea would come back. And suddenly the sea that was hemming Israel in for their death became the means by which God would deliver them from the army of Egypt. And they rightly said, we didn't see that coming. I, have, I think God has, has things in store for you you would not believe. Don't be surprised, though, that you don't see it yet coming. Because what he wants to birth in me while I wait is not a fearfulness, but the opposite. It's a faith. It's a faith. I so appreciate what it is that... Um, uh, oh, let me just make these three points. I don't want to move on. Three certainties. God's people often don't know what is coming. That's normal. Second of all, God does know what's coming because it's his plan. So in Isaiah 46, we read, I made known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come, I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So we serve a God who knows what he's doing and his will is being done. There's an assurance in that. And so third, I trust this better future that the Lord is bringing forth. I so appreciate with Corrie ten Boom for all that she went through in Nazi Germany as a Dutch woman whose family concealed Jewish escapees from Nazism and all that she endured as a Christian. But she is the one who said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Because while you don't know what the future is, you do know the one who does and he loves you. So let's just start with, it's normal to not know the future. Something strange is not happening to any one of us. This is what it means to be a follower of the Lord. And because this is a follower of the Lord, I'm going to move on to the second point. The second thing we see is, when facing the unexpected, what we need to do is think straw. <laughs> straw. I'm working on my acronyms, okay? I'm trying to get better at this. So here's my acronym, STRAW. And this is what we see happening in Acts chapter 1. Here it is. These words stand for, first of all, stop. Instead of running around and bonking your head into things as you panic when, unexpected, when you're facing the unexpected, stop. 
where you are. How many times have our kids been in a dangerous place? Oh my gosh, my child's playing on the roof. What do I say to them? I say, stop. <laughs> Don't take another step. Stop right where you are. Stop. Remember God. Make him be your first thought because every time you're frightened about the future, your uncertainty of the future is your biggest thought, not him. That's why you're afraid. I don't know what's going to happen. My bank account is low. They're laying off people at work. This rumor has been spread about me that I don't know what that means for my future. Right? That becomes the thing you think about. And that's why, that's why it's having control in your life. Because you're letting it be God. Instead of stopping and saying, even though this thing is going on and there's threat all around me that seems like it can hurt me, Lord, you're my thought. I'm going to remember you. I stop. I remember God. I ask for his help. Lord, please, I need you. <laughs> could, I, could I get a little help down here? I think he is so much more willing to bless us than we're willing to receive when the blessing is his blessing. I, in my mind's eye, I just see heaven straining to pour out his, and blessing, he defines blessing. For him to pour out his blessing, in fact, he likely already is, brother and sister in Christ. He's already given you every spiritual blessing in Christ. You already have it. So stop and remember him, ask for him to work in this circumstance, and W could be wait until he answers or watch for the answer he gives, but immediately do your best to be a follower of Jesus Christ in that moment. And that's what it is I think we see taking place with the, with the disciples. So back to Acts chapter 1, verse 12. When they returned to Jerusalem, right? So this has happened. Jesus just went to heaven. Now nobody, he's not here anymore. These angels said, he's coming back just like he went before. So after, eventually they go back to Jerusalem. Um, from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And what is it they, what is it they do? And when they, were, when they entered, right, they went in a, the upper room where they were staying. And Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, tells us who's there. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus. Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James. These are real people. This happened to real people in history. Okay, but what are they doing? Verse 14, this is the first time we see the disciples with the training wheels of Jesus' presence kicked off. What do they do? He didn't give them instructions. He didn't say, in a minute, <laughs> I'm going, this is what you should do. They were on their own to make decisions at this point. And so what is it they do after three years of being with Jesus? What did he train them to do? Verse 14, all of these were of one accord, they were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Jesus is gone and they straw. This is what they do. This is what the discipleship of Jesus taught them to do. Perhaps it's every bit as important what they do not do. They did not go into a panic. Jesus had ascended to heaven. <laughs> He's gone and they didn't panic. They didn't tack a little prayer in the beginning of a strategic planning meeting, though I'm not opposed to strategic planning. I am opposed to strategic planning that thinks strategic planning brings the kingdom of God. I think God brings the kingdom of God. And our strategic planning is our best effort to align with what it is that he's already doing. But they didn't do that. What they did do when they didn't know what else to do was to actually pause and gather everybody they could possibly gather and begin to pray. And they prayed for 40 days. They prayed. And then look what God did through them. What would happen if we prayed like that? What would happen in your life if, if actually remembering you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're praying like you're actually a follower of Jesus Christ and you're looking for his leading and his empowering and his work? What if that's the way we lived? We are, I am, starting with me, practical atheists all the time. I might even have a habit of prayer that I check off, but I live my day so often as if I'm the agent that's bringing about a better future rather than him. And these folks weren't like that. And they kept praying and they kept praying. Verse 14, they devoted themselves to prayer together. It reminds me of Moses, right, who said, when Moses said, I'm done with you guys. I'll send an angel. You get up. You go into the promised land. The angel will take care of you. And Moses said, uh-uh, I'm not going. We are not going without you. 
I'm really serious. What if we, as a church family, had that mindset? Because this is so much more than a movie theater where you just happen to be sitting in the same room with other people. You are a part of a church family, a local expression of a body of Christ in which there you have the opportunity to be devoted to one another in love, in prayer support for each other, in the using of your gifts for each other, in together, discerning what we together can do that no one of us could possibly do. To the measure, I think, because this isn't my idea. Lakeland's not my idea. I'm a servant. I'm here today. I may be gone tomorrow. I have no idea. All I know is Jesus is here. This is his church, a local expression. And, and I believe if we are utterly committed to him and to what he's doing in this church, and I know we have jobs, and I know we have responsibilities. We have missions work to do at Abbott and at Lakes High School and when I'm working in the park district, so we're missionaries out there, but if we are utterly devoted to him and actually seeking him as a church family, who knows, what, what do you think he wants to do? It's not tame. He wants to expose hidden sin in our lives that's choking our sensitivity to the spirit of God. He's wanting to confront what is our unwillingness to be reconciled with people with whom we're not in a good place. He's wanting us to get over our fear of money and our materialism that clings to stuff and calls money mine when it's all his. He wants us to find together the joy of the kingdom of God in our midst. That's what he wants for us. He wants in us something that anyone who walks in this room can't say anything other than surely God is in that place. And it comes from being all in, invested in the way that we see folks here. You know, it's funny when you, when you track through the book of Acts, the prominence of prayer. And if I had another half an hour, I'd read all of them, all 33 times. 33 mentions to prayer and the 23 times in the book of Acts when we see God's people stop to pray. But let me just mention a couple of them. Here, Acts 1, 14 and then 24, they spend these weeks of time praying. We don't know what he said, something about a gift and we shouldn't leave. So we don't even know what that means. But we're here and we're staying and we're praying and we're watching. Chapter 2, verse 42, when thousands of people became Christians, they were in Jerusalem and they were devoted to apostles, teaching and fellowship and breaking bread and say it out loud, they were devoted to, they were devoted to prayer. Devoted to prayer means you actually say no to other things to pray and not just privately in your own lives, but together with us as a church. You devote time to praying as a church, with us as a church. Chapter three, verse one, Peter was on his way to prayer <laughs> when he saw the man who was lame and he said, give me money. And Peter said, I don't have any money, but I'll give you what I got. In the name of the Lord Jesus, rise. And this man suddenly stands up and is healed and another crowd gathers and he preaches another sermon and a whole bunch more folks get saved and become baptized on the way to prayer. Chapter 4, verse 24, when the church heard Peter was released from prison, they all gathered and they thanked the Lord and they asked that God would make them bold to go into the streets and tell people about Jesus. And the place they were meeting was shaken. Chapter 6, verse 4, the disciples established deacons to serve this holy work of serving Greek widows who didn't have food. What a holy thing. But they needed to be devoted to teaching and to prayer. Chapter 7, verse 59, it, while Stephen was being stoned, he was praying and seeing Jesus. Chapter 8, Peter and John arrive in Antioch and they gather the church and what do they do? They pray and God's spirit falls on them. Several other key places. Chapter 9, it's while Peter is praying that he receives a vision from the Lord. I won't unpack it other than to say the means by which God was speaking to the church that Jewish Christians should welcome Gentile Christians. A really big deal. Peter only saw this vision because he took time to pray. As happened when he entered Cornelius' home, this Gentile who became a follower of Jesus. Chapter 13, it, in Antioch, the church is gathered worshiping the Lord and praying. And that's when the Holy Spirit said, set apart to be Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them, which was essentially the beginning of the missionary endeavor of the church outside into the Gentile world. And we're in this room today because in Acts chapter 13, some of our brothers and sisters prayed and then they obeyed the leading of God. When we don't know what to do, don't be shocked. Let that be a reason to stop and to pray, <laughs> to stop, to remember the Lord, to ask him to work and to watch. And I'll just say it, Lakeland, 
I think we, by God's grace, I think we've made some really critical steps forward in prayer. So, and this is all glory to God, but for the last two and a half years, every single Saturday morning from seven to eight, the elders have been meeting for two and a half years we've been doing this. We meet on Zoom and we take time together to adore the Lord, to confess our sins to one another. We take time then to thank him for his gifts and to pray and intercede for you and for each other. Our elder chair, Dan Berg, was the one that spoke this picture to us and it gripped our hearts and God provided leadership through our brother and something holy has been happening in our eldership. And for the last months, our staff has never prayed as much as we're praying right now. Three days a week, we stop and we take time at the beginning of our day, the two days in the beginning of the day and then during staff to say, God, this is your work, this is your to-do list, you have to lead us. But I think we could grow in our prayer with one another as a church. So today in our congregational meeting at one, we have some things to share with you. Frankly, they're incredibly encouraging. Some things that are happening, some things that are coming. We're going to get through those. We're going to share those things, but we're going to take the second half of our time as a church and pray together. That's what we're going to do is pray together online. One o'clock, join us on Zoom. August 20th, we have another elder concert of prayer set aside from 9 to 1030. One of our elders, Charlie Crowthers, is leading us through that time. Be devoted to this right? Be a part of seeking the face of God, and may he lead us more and more and more to prayer. I would love to be launching a prayer team that's much more involved, and if that's on your heart and grips your heart, and you're like, oh, I've been waiting to hear that. Come talk to me afterwards. But may we not be shocked that we don't know the future, but when we don't know the future, may we straw, may we stop, may we remember the Lord, may we ask him to lead, show himself, and then may we watch and follow. That's what we see happening in our brothers and sisters in the book of Acts. Praise be to God. Third, when you don't know what to do, <laughs> obey the commands you do. So while you're waiting for God to answer, I think it's also significant that if you have, if there are any commands you know he wants you to obey, that you do them. So Acts chapter 1 verse 15, in these days, during this entire time, while they're praying, Peter stood up to the brothers, stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was all about 120. So there were 120 people praying. Wouldn't you have loved to have been in that thing? Devoting to prayer and waiting on, what are we praying for? We don't know. We just know that God has a plan and we want to walk in it. Peter stood up, stood up among them and said, verse 16, brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, so Peter was thinking the scriptures. He was looking at what had happened through the spectacle of the scriptures. And he realized that in the Old Testament, God had already foretold that one of the disciples would betray Jesus. And so he says that, verse 17, for he was numbered among us, as he quotes this prophecy, he was numbered among us and was allotted his share of this ministry, but they turned away. We don't we don't, we don't often talk about what it must have been like for the disciples to process Judas' betrayal. The anger of it, maybe the guilt of, was he going sideways and I didn't notice and do anything about it? Perhaps the sadness, I mean, they loved, they loved each other. Perhaps the sadness of that, it was a human thing that he betrayed. But one thing Peter did was to, to notice, to see Peter betrayed us and through the spectacles of the scriptures, you know what that means? we realized this was something God knew was coming and he, and he shared it. And so he goes on to say, we need to find a successor. And that's what unfolds during those verses, which ultimately in verse 26 leads to this. And they cast lots for them, for these two men who'd come forward. And the lot fell to Matthias and he was now numbered among the 11 others. And my point in all of this was, while I'm waiting, I'm not called to passivity. I'm called to obey what I know to do where I am. So if you have uncertainty about something big in your days, okay, don't be shocked. Straw, <laughs> straw, stop, remember the law, remember the Lord, ask for his help, right? And watch for what he's doing, wait for his answer. But in the meantime, get about the business of being holy. And so that's what those five banners on the wall are about. If you don't know what else to do, I would say, make sure you're spending time in the scriptures and prayer. Make sure you're investing and in being connected with other believers, not just to receive from them, but to serve them, that you're leaving the people, every person you encounter better because you've served them. Live a life of surrender, of generosity, this generosity of releasing time 
and abilities and talents and, yes, money and prayer that I live lives like our Lord did, who emptied himself, that I'm constantly emptying myself for the people around me. Live that, love, that life of genero generosity, um, which is related to service. And finally, pray that you have opportunities to tell the people around you about the hope you have in Jesus Christ. Be building relationships with folks who don't know him. Be praying for folks you don't know. I just put two more names in my prayer book from Denny's, uh, last Sunday actually, of two folks. I'm like, I see you all the time. What's your name? And this guy said, he shook my hand and what he didn't know is he just landed in my daily prayer book, <laughs> okay? And there's a waitress at Denny's that just had a really bad surgery last week and she was in my prayer book. And it's like, what a great thing that I can, I try, I don't always, but I try to pray for them every day. May you be praying for folks that God's placed in your lives. Get about doing those things while you wait and see what it is that God does. And friends, I think in all of this, when I don't know the future, I know a God who does. So when I was little, my, we had hockey tickets. My family's a hockey, hockey team. My brother played in college, and um, my dad got a scholarship to play college hockey, and so hockey was a big thing for us. We had tickets to the Blues, because I grew up in St. Louis. They were right behind the, the, uh, right behind the penalty box, which is a fascinating place to have season tickets right there, right? And I remember a time when I was young going to hockey games. The North Stars used to be in Minnesota, and that, this was back in the day when, you know, goalies didn't all have masks on their face, for instance. The North Stars, this is, I'm just telling you this because it's entertaining to me. Gump Worsley was the Minnesota North Stars goalie who didn't, have a, didn't wear a mask, right? And so I saw his, his, uh, his rookie card. He was a really, like, strapping, attractive guy when he was younger. But by the time I saw him, he'd been hit in the face with hockey pucks and sticks. He was an ugly man. I remember standing right by the blue line and he looked over at me and I'm like, ah, right? So going to hockey games was kind of a regular thing for me when I was little. And I remember one time particularly when I was at a hockey game with my dad, it was time to go. And I have this memory of walking out to the cars. Now, you know what it's like to leave a professional sporting event. They're just people everywhere. So when you're this tall, all you see are knees and waist. That's all you see. And I remember, I remember exactly where we were in the stadium now, for the, what used to be the Checker Dome in St. Louis, walking out looking for a car. And I remember seeing knees. I didn't know where the car was. If I found the car, which I had no idea how to find, I had no idea how to get home from there. But I didn't feel the slightest amount of worry for one reason and one reason only. And that's because I was being held by the hand of my father. And as long, it didn't even cross my mind to be nervous because I knew my future was in his hand. I want to say, my friends, that's the place we find ourselves in today, in the hand of our Father. May God free us from the fear of the future because we put him before us. We're going to finish the last time I'm going to do this today, offering this prayer together. We are in the discipline of trying to preach to ourselves the truth about God that frees us from fear. So can we close our message time by offering a prayer together? Go ahead and stand. If you didn't grab one of the way in, that's fine. You can grab one of the way out, but we'll do this from the overhead. Can we together remember our God who frees us from fear as we pray this prayer together? Please pray with me to the Lord. Father, when fear rises in my heart, help me remember you. Because you promised, I will keep in perfect peace the one whose mind is stead upon me. Remind me that Jesus promised, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Help me believe that you did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, I renounce fear, for you have commanded me again and again, do not be afraid. I renounce the fear of the future, for my future is in your hands and you make all things beautiful in your time. I renounce my fear of enemies, physical and spiritual, because you command me, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or frightened, for the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. I reject the fear of Satan and his demons because when I submit to you, I can resist the devil and he will flee from me. I renounce my fear of tomorrow because you command us to leave tomorrow with you. I choose not to fear the opinions of other people, remembering that fear of man is a snare, but whoever trusts the Lord is safe. 
I know that when I try to please men, I am no longer a servant of Christ. I resist fear of embarrassment that keeps me from joining groups and other Christians because you commanded that we should not forsake assembling together. I reject the fear that my life is less than I hoped, remembering Jesus warned that in this life we will have trouble, but that we are not made for this world, but for the next. I renounce loving money because you warned that I cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I renounce fearing for my future because you promised you would provide all I need when I seek first you and your kingdom. I renounce the fear of natural disasters because you have said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. I renounce the fear of illness and disease because you can heal your people and let them enjoy abundant peace and security. I renounce my fear of death because you said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I should fear no evil for you are with me and that to live is Christ and to die is gain. I renounce the fear of saying goodbye to a terminally ill loved one because Jesus promised in my father's house are many rooms and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will take you to myself that where I am, you will be also. I fear not the day of my death, because you have written my days in your book before one of them came to pass, and because as a Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I reject the fear of suffering, because you have promised that your grace is sufficient for me and your power is made perfect in my weakness. I also believe that the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in me. I renounce fear of martyrdom because we fear not those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, we fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I reject the fear that I am unloved because neither life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I reject fearing for my children as if they were outside of your care, for you are working in their lives so that they will say, I am the Lord's, and write the Lord's on their hand. I renounce the fear of failure because you promised, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. I renounce my desire to increase my own glory and choose instead to give glory to you who alone is worthy of praise. I declare that Jesus is Lord of all. I commit to being a witness of Jesus Christ. I submit to your Lordship in every area of my life. Jesus is the Lord of my home. Jesus is Lord of my family. Jesus is Lord of my friendships. Jesus is Lord of my future. Jesus is Lord of my needs. Jesus is Lord of my city. Jesus is Lord of my nation and all nations. Grant me your grace to live without fear for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to respond to the Lord, our prayer team will be in front. You're helped in being freed from fear if you stand with someone and confess, I need help for this. Please pray for me. So prayer team, pray for God's leading in people's lives or any other burden that you bring today. We would love to pray with you. Let's respond to the Lord.